All right, so I'm going to keep on going with my own vanity. I'm enjoying making these videos. I enjoy expressing myself. And when I read a book by myself, I feel like it's just, I get the knowledge and the wisdom, but I'm not actually putting it out there. So it's not communication. It's just being embedded into my brain. Alright, so, um, carrying on, page 155. So, throughout history, we've witnessed the following pattern. Certain people stand out from the crowd because of some special skill or talent that they have. Perhaps they're masters at the political game, knowing how to charm and win the proper allies, or maybe they have superior technical knowledge in their field, or maybe they're the ones who initiate some bold venture that has success. In any event, these types suddenly find themselves in leadership positions, something for which their past experience and education has not prepared them. Now they're alone and on top. Their every decision and action is scrutinized by the group and the public. The pressures become intense, and what inevitably happens is that many of them unconsciously succumb to all kinds of fears. Whereas before they might have been bold and creative, now they grow cautious and conservative aware of the heightened tale, secretly scared of being held accountable for the success of the group. They over-delegate, pull everyone for their opinions, or they refrain from making the hard decisions, or they become excessively dictatorial, trying to control everything, another sign of weakness and insecurity. It's a story of great senators who make lousy presidents, bold lieutenants who turn into mediocre generals, or top-level managers who become incompetent executives. And yet, among the group, there are inevitably a few who demonstrate the opposite. They rise to the position, displaying extraordinary leadership skills that no one had suspected were even in them. We find this in people like Napoleon Bonaparte, Mahatma Gandhi, Winston Churchill. What links these people together is not some mysterious skill or bit of knowledge, uh, but rather a quality of character, a temperament that reveals the essence of art. They are fearless. They do not shrink for making the hard decisions by themselves. Instead, they seem to relish such responsibility. They do not suddenly become more conservative, but in fact they show a propensity for bold action. They exhibit tremendous grace under fire. Such types come to understand in various ways that a leader has a unique power that generally goes untapped. Any group tends to assume the spirit and energy of the person on top. If that person is weak and passive, then the group tends to splinter into factions, and if such leaders lack confidence, their insecurities tend to filter their way down the line. Their nervous, fretful moods put everyone on edge, but there is always the opposite possibility. A leader who is audacious, out in front, setting the tone and the agenda for the group, sparks a higher energy level and confidence. Such a person on top does not need to yell or push people around. Those below want to follow his or her lead because it is strong. And it's inspiring. In war, where leadership skills are more immediately apparent and necessary because lives are at stake, we can distinguish two leadership styles, one from behind or one from the front. The former type of general likes to stay in his tent or headquarters and he bark out orders, feeling that they have such distance makes it easier to command. Well, this style can also mean involving lieutenants and other generals in important decisions, choosing to lead by committee. In both cases, the commander is trying to hide him for himself from scrutiny, accountability, and danger. The greatest generals in history, however, are invariably those who lead from the front and by themselves. They can be seen by the troops at the head of the army, exposing themselves to the same fate as any foot soldier. The Duke of Wellington said that the mere appearance of Napoleon Bonaparte at the head of his army translated into the equivalent of an additional 40,000 men. A kind of electric charge passes through the troops. He's sharing in their sacrifices, leading by example. It almost has religious connotations. Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon was right in the front, right at the head of the troops. I'd rather much trust the general out in the field than some cooped up president in the war room. General's out there fighting with you. That's the man I trust. Bunch of aristocrats sitting in a room back home. Those people I do not trust. We notice the same two styles in business and politics as well. You got executives who lead from behind, who will always try to disguise it as a virtue, the need for secrecy, or their desire to be more fair and democratic. But it really stems from fear, and it invariably leads to a lack of respect from those below. 
The opposite style, leading from the front and by example, has the same power in the office as it does in the battlefield. Leaders who work harder than anybody else, who practice what they preach, who are not afraid to be accountable for the tough decisions, to take the risk, will find that they've created a well of respect that will pay great dividends on down the road. They can ask for sacrifices, they can punish the troublemakers, and make occasional mistakes, all without facing the usual grumbling and doubts. They don't have to yell, complain, and force their men and women to follow. People just do so willingly. In urban environments such as Southside Queens, respect is an important issue. In other places, your background, education, and resume might lend you some authority and credibility, but not in the hood. There, everyone starts from zero. To gain respect from your peers, you must repeatedly prove yourself. People are constantly prone to doubting your abilities and your power. You must show again and again that you have what it takes to thrive in the last. Big words and promises mean nothing. Only actions carry weight. If you're authentic, as tough as you seem to be, then you will earn the respect that will make people back off and make your life that much easier. This should be your perspective as well. You start with nothing in this world. Any titles, money, or privilege you inherit are actually hindrances. They delude you into believing that you're owed respect. If you continue to impose your will because of such privileges, people will come to disdain and despise you. And instead, only your actions can prove your worth. They tell people who you are. You must imagine that you are continually being challenged to show that you deserve the position you occupy. In a culture full of fakery and hype, you will stand out as, a, as someone authentic and worthy of respect. The greatest leaders in history all inevitably learn by experience. Uh, by experience, the following lesson is much better to be feared and respected than to be loved. It's better to be feared and respected than to be loved. That's a, a lesson that all these great leaders have learned. So as a prime example, let's take a look at... Film director John Ford, the man behind some of the greatest films in Hollywood history. The task of film directors can be particularly difficult. They have to deal with large crews, actors with their delicate egos, and dictatorial producers who want to meddle every step of the way, all the while being under extreme time limits and with large amounts of money at stake. The tendency for directors is to give ground on these various battlefields, to placate and cajole the actors, to let the producers have their way here and there to gain some cooperation by being pleasant and likable. Ford was by nature a sensitive and empathetic man, but he learned that if he revealed this side of his personality, he quickly lost control over the final product. The actors and producers would begin to assert themselves, and the film would lose any sense of cohesion. He noticed that the notorious, notoriously nice directors never really lasted that long. They were pushed around, and their films were lousy. Early on in his career, he decided that he would have to forge a kind of mask for himself, that of a man who was implacable and even a bit frightening. On the set, he made it clear that he was not the usual prima donna director. He'd work longer hours than anyone else, and if they were filming on some location with harsh conditions, he'd sleep in a tent just like everybody else, and he would share their bad food. On occasion, he would get into violent fist fights on the set, most often with his leading actors, such as John Wayne. So this guy is uh, John Ford is getting into fights with John Wayne, right? John Wayne, the old cowboy, the old tough and rough cowboy, right? Yeah, well, John Wayne wasn't shit compared to John Ford. These fights were not for show. They were bruising, and he engaged in them with all his strength, making the actors fight back with equal force. Well, this would set a tone. An actor would tend to feel embarrassed by engaging in his usual prissy behavior and ego tantrums. Everyone was treated the same. Even the Archduke of Austria, trying to carve out a career as a Hollywood actor, was yelled at and pushed into a ditch by John Ford himself. He had a unique way of directing actors. He would say only a few well-chosen words about what he wanted from them. Then, if they did the wrong thing on the set, he would brutally humiliate them in front of everyone. They quickly learned they had to pay attention to the few words he spoke and to his body language on the set which would often tell more. They had to raise their levels of concentration and bring even more of themselves into the part. Once, when the famous producer, Samuel Goldwyn, visited the set, he told Ford he wanted to watch him work, which is a producer's way of spying and applying pressure. Ford didn't say a word. The next day, however, he visited Goldwyn in his office and just sat silently in the chair by Goldwyn's desk, glaring at him. 
After a while, Goldwyn, exasperated, asked him what he was doing. He said he just wanted to watch Goldwyn work, Ford answered. Goldwyn never visited him again on the set, and he quickly learned to give John Ford his space. All this had a strange and paradoxical, paradoxical effect on the cast and crew. They came to love working for John Ford and would die to gain a place among his executive team of returned staff. His standards were so high, it forced him to work even harder, and he made them superior actors and technicians. An occasional nice gesture or compliment on his part carried double the weight and would be remembered for a lifetime. The end results of his tough and unforgiving manner was that he managed to maintain a higher degree of control over the final product than other directors, and his films were consistently of the highest quality. Nobody dared to challenge his authority, and he lasted in Hollywood as the king of westerns and action films for over 40 years. An unprecedented achievement in the industry. So understand, to be a leader often requires making tough choices, getting people to do things against their will. If you have chosen the soft, pleasing, compliant style of leadership out of fear of being disliked, you'll find yourself with less and less room to compel people to work harder or to make sacrifices. If you suddenly, suddenly try to be tough, they often feel wounded and personally upset. They can move from love to hate. The opposite approach yields the opposite result. If you build a reputation for toughness and getting results, people might resent you, but you will establish a foundation of respect. You're demonstrating genuine qualities of leadership that speak to everyone. Now with time and a well-founded authority, you have room to back off and reward people, even to be nice. When you do so, it will seem as a genuine gesture. Not an attempt to get people to like you, and it will have double the effect. So it's much easier to be a fighter and give out a, dole out a little bit of love, because then people will love that little bit of love that you get, and they'll appreciate it, than to be a lover who fights every once in a while. The people will only get used to your love, and they will resent you when you want them to do something that you want them to do. So, 50th Law and Robert Greene is saying, use that fear. Use fear to make you a leader. So, the key is to fearlessness. For it is the general rule of human nature that people despise those who treat them well and look up to those who make no concessions. So, if people treat you nice, people despise you. But if you don't make any concessions, then they admire you and they respect you. Kind of fucked up, if you ask me. It's a little bit fucked up, but that's how that's how life works, right? Human nature's fucked up. And you know what? I didn't start the fire. It wasn't me that started it. This fire's been burning ever since the world started turning. <laughs> and war, you know, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Say it again. War. What's it good for? Nothing. <laughs> Thousands of years ago, our most primitive ancestors formed groups for power and protection. But as these groups got larger, they encountered a problem with human nature that plagues us to this day. Individuals have different levels of talent, ambition, and assertiveness. Their interests do not necessarily converge on all points. When it comes to the important decisions upon which the fate of the tribe hangs, the members will often think of their own narrow agendas. A group of humans is always on the verge of splintering into a chaos of divergent interests. For this purpose, leaders were chosen to make the hard decisions and end all dissension. But the members of the tribe would inevitably feel ambivalence towards their leaders. They saw the necessity for them and the respect that should be paid to their authority, but they feared that their chieftains and kings would accumulate too much power, and then they would oppress them. They often wondered why this particular person or family deserved such a lofty position. In many ancient cultures, the king was ritually put to death after a few years to ensure that he would not turn into an oppressor. In more advanced ancient civilizations, there were constant rebellions against those in power, much more intense and numerous than anything that we have known in the modern era. <coughs> So, and we're going to talk about Moses here in a second. Moses, who led the slaves up out of Egypt. Moses. The Bible's got lots of inspiring stories, so I'll probably keep on reading some more. 50 Cent. Fear nothing. Robert Greene. 50 Cent. Johnny Tsunami. <laughs> 